Now let's have some truth talk here for a moment, okay? Are you okay to be a little vulnerable if you're a Lakers fan or somebody that bought into the media hype before the NBA season started? What were you expecting to happen? Like, you're probably asking yourself, what happened to the Lakers this year? What went wrong? Now the snark in me would say, well, what's wrong with you? How the hell could you not see this coming? But the, the more important question is, what did you expect to happen? I mean, seriously, what did you expect to happen? It's not like you were talking about a Lakers team that was this close to the title last year and then they made like one big massive move to bring in like one more key piece. This was a Lakers team that was 42 and 30 last year, seventh in the West, that got bounced pretty easily by the Phoenix Suns, to which some of you are going to point out, well, if Anthony Davis, if AD is healthy, well, shit. You want to talk about the ultimate what if, huh? If ifs and buts were candies and nuts, it'd be Christmas every day. Yeah, if he was healthy. Well, the problem is, ultimately, he didn't end up being. And even if he was, it wouldn't have made the difference. The Suns were the better team. They were going to beat him. Period. So you're talking about a Lakers team that I am not going to sit here and crap on them for winning a championship in the bubble in 2020. Others do. Not my place. Because there are pieces to winning in the bubble that are perhaps even more complicated and more challenging. There are pieces, perhaps of being in the bubble where you said, hey, in most normal years, especially with home court advantages, you wouldn't have seen a five-seeded Heat team in the NBA Finals that still took you to six games. Yeah, I mean, you can make plenty of arguments on both sides, but ultimately, at the end of the day, any NBA championship you win is a legit NBA championship, no matter how much we might have to diminish it or dismiss it or whatever. But this was a team already clearly under the decline. You were going to go into this season with LeBron James turning 37. So you know that you're going to have some type of decline somewhere. Whether that is in his performance, his durability, combination of those factors. Decline on the defensive end? Well, shit, he hasn't really given a consistent flying fuck on that end of the floor for over half a decade now. But then you have Anthony Davis, you know, as Charles Barkley calls them, street clothes. He's a waiting injury waiting to happen, or walking injury waiting to happen. Like, this is your core. An injury-prone stretch five who can't shoot for shit from the outside, and a 37-year-old, am I a point guard, am I a three, am I a four? Who the hell cares? I'm just pursuing Kareem and the all-time scoring mark here. Like, that was your foundation. And in the offseason, the Lakers got rid of Kentavious Caldwell-Pope, Montrez Harrell, Kyle Kuzma, Alex Caruso, Markeith Morris, Dennis Schroeder. And I know a lot of Lakers fans were all types of critical of Dennis Schroeder last year, and maybe legitimately so, but uh, be careful what you wish for because you just might get it. Like, this was not like a slight shifting of a team that finished 7th in the West last year. This was a fundamental remake around your two key core cogs. One that's injury prone as hell and the other one that's going to be 37. That's inherently incredibly risky. And not only are you shaking it up dramatically, you're fundamentally remaking your team in a not very logical way. And I know a lot of people are going to point to Russell Westbrook and say that was the problem. You know me, I did a video about this last summer. Basically calling the shot. Like, how the hell did you think this was going to work out? Westbrook was going to be 33 this year and on his fourth team in four years. And I don't give a shit about the excuses or whatever you want to do. At some point in time, you've got to realize that these teams keep bringing them in and then they don't want anything with them anymore. Like Oklahoma City, he was there for years. Fine, he was a franchise guy. And then once they got rid of PG-13, they said, okay, we'll move Russell Westbrook. Houston had him for a year, got rid of him. Washington had him for a year, couldn't wait to fucking get rid of him. Ding dong, dumb dick, at some point in time, you would think that would tell you something. He's a ball-dominant guy who by nature will get to be less by either his age 
or his role. Because now he's going into a spot where he's not the guy that can just run crazy and do whatever the fuck he wants. Like, he's got to defer to LeBron. He's got to defer to Anthony Davis. So you're trading all of these core role players, core pieces, to bring in a guy that's already a depreciated asset just because of the role that he's going to play with your Lakers team. It's like trying to recreate the Miami Heat here. Trying to build a goddamn super team with forgetting totally what the hell made that all work. He's either he's going to be less or he's going to try and be the same Russell Westbrook as always. Can't shoot worth a shit. Won't defend anybody. Ball vacuumed to all fucking degrees. And the other players on the team suffer. You bring in Carmelo Anthony... Another mid-30s guy, 37 this year. He's an adequate but not great three-point shooter. And who exactly would Carmelo defend? Like He's a good role player at this stage of his career, but that's what he is. Like People getting caught up in the names and not realizing the reality. Like Carmelo's still got some time left in his legs and in his career for sure, especially in the role he's been playing the past couple of years in Portland and Los Angeles, but that's it. I mean, basically, you trade a Kuzma and replace him with a Carmelo. I know they weren't trade for each other, but you get what I'm saying. So maybe you say Carmelo's a little bit better of an offensive player, but is he really another high-volume, low-efficiency scorer? What do you lose on the defensive side? Now, sure, you look at Kendrick Nunn and you say he missed the entire season due to injury. The two-year, $10 million contract certainly seemed like a bargain. It was worth the roll of the dice, but it didn't work. And sometimes shit happens. You're right. Shit happens. It didn't work. Malik Monk was a nice move, a good move in theory. It would appear compared to a Contavious Caldwell Pope that he was an upgrade, but he's more of an upgrade on offense and a downgrade defensively. Wayne Ellington they brought in. Another example of, you know, if you're saying, hey, brought in Wayne Ellington and Malik Monk, and that meant that you had to let an Alex Crusoe go because you decided you wanted to keep Taylor Horton Tucker. Like, something is fundamentally wrong with you. You bring in Dwight Howard back. Yeah, he was on the championship team a couple of years ago, but he's 36 years old. Like, how much do you think he's really going to be able to give you? Small burst, and that's it. So you deplete this team of its core role players, several of whom played a part in you winning a championship or even being in that seventh spot in the West last year. And then what did you replace them with? A 37-year-old role player who's not going to defend anybody, and is a middling shooter, frankly. Russell Westbrook, I mean, what the fuck else can you say? Like, if you guys don't get this at this point, I don't know what else to tell you. The most overrated Hall of Famer in NBA history, bar none. And then you pass on bringing in DeMar DeRozan because you say, nah, we'd rather trade to bring in Russell Westbrook. Even though this would be his fourth team in four years, and Jesus... Houston had him for a year, didn't want him. Washington had him for a year, couldn't wait to get rid of him. You would think, buddy, that should tell you something. So the Lakers in this last offseason got worse offensively, especially from a shooting standpoint, and got significantly worse defensively, and the numbers backed that up. They were only 11th in the league in points per game. They were 28th in the league in points allowed per game. Only 22nd in the league in three-point shooting percentage. 29th in free throw percentage. Holy Christ. No wonder this team finished out of even the play-in game. Like they couldn't even finish in the top 10 of the Western Conference. And I know you're going to say, well, missing half of the season with Anthony Davis. That certainly had an impact, and it did. Russell Westbrook is a chode, and he sucked. And he did. LeBron missed almost 30 games. He did. But still, what the fuck did you expect to happen? How could you honestly have looked at this roster construction and thought this team was going to be better than they were last year? Hell, last year would have been the ceiling for them. And as much as you could blame all these other things, the person that deserves the blame is the general manager of the Los Angeles Lakers. And if you say Rob Palenka, you should kick yourself in the cock slash cunt. The general manager of the Los Angeles Lakers is LeBron James. You can't sit there and call yourself the king and expect other people to call you the king.
and not expect to get some of the criticism when your bullshit doesn't work. Who's the mastermind that orchestrated all these roster moves? LeBron has his fingerprints all over this. I'm going to bring in my friend Carmelo Anthony. Okay, and what's that going to do for you? Yeah, Anthony Davis and I got together and we think it would be great to bring in Russell Westbrook. Maybe this is exactly why general managers should be general managers and players should be players because clearly LeBron didn't know what the fuck he was doing. Never mind the fact that you could point to, hey, he averaged over 30 points a game this year. But yeah, his effort at times was absolutely pathetic and he played the worst defense I've seen him play in a long damn time. The league is soft as fucking Charmin now, as much as it ever has been. You know, all that stat chasing he was doing late in games, driving to the hoop when his team's down 20 with a minute to go. Like, if you can't see what's going on here, I don't know what the hell's wrong with you. But this team over the past few years has undercut all of their young core to bring in an Anthony Davis, and then he misses half the season. Well, there's problem there. LeBron James isn't getting any younger, and his body's going to start breaking down, and it did again this year. Of course, as many games as that man has played over two decades in the league, of course his body's going to eventually break down. It's a freaking man-child, but still, that's a lot of and miles on his damn body, a lot of weight that he carries. I'm not calling him out of shape. He certainly is fucking not. He takes great care of himself and his body, but eventually Father Time is undefeated, and those miles, those NBA miles, catch up to everybody. And they have with LeBron, even though he was still able to have this great statistical season, what does it really mean? As he was basically playing one side of the floor pretty much all the time, and some of that was stat chasing, and you fucking good and well know it. But thinking that a Russell Westbrook was going to take you to another level is just stupidity of the highest order. That's not paying attention to reality. That's getting caught up in the name and caught up in this. And this is that whole notion of when you talk about super teams, it sounds great on paper until you got to figure out how these pieces all fit together. And are you paying a premium price for a player that by function, when you bring them in, are going to be at a lesser level because the only way it's going to work is they have to sacrifice something. And potentially everybody's got to sacrifice something. And is that what you really want to do? And do you really want to sacrifice anything for a damn Russell Westbrook in his mid-30s? Good Lord. Of course it went wrong. It was a combination of injuries, old core players, Westbrook having probably the worst season he's had in his career in a decade. Carmelo's only going to give you so much. LeBron statistically looks great, but that's not the reality. How many times he passed off in key situations because he was afraid of getting fouled or afraid of missing the clutch shot. Anthony Davis missed half the season. Like, you let guys like Alex Caruso go and trade Kuzma and trade Caldwell Pope and Harrell. How much would those guys have helped you some this year? Even if you say, well, Alex Caruso only played half the season him damn self, he probably would have rather had 40 games of Caruso than 78 of Russell Westbrook. And certainly would have rather had 40-something games of Caruso than zero games of Kendrick Nunn. Just saying. And imagine praising LeBron James when he puts together a super team and then not hitting him with the criticism that he richly deserves for being at this moment the worst general manager in the NBA. He decided he would rather have Russell Westbrook than DeMar DeRozan. And all DeMar DeRozan did with the opportunities he got in Chicago this year was have his highest per game scoring average. You know, could have been an MVP caliber season. He averaged almost 28 a game. Guarantee you the fucking Lakers could have gotten a lot more value out of a DeMar DeRozan while paying him less, mind you, than they did for a Russell Westbrook. And they would have been able to keep some of those pieces too. So when you look at the Lakers, you can blame Russell Westbrook till you're blue in the fucking face. You can blame Anthony Davis because he can't stay healthy. The person you need to blame, though, is the worst general manager in the NBA today, LeBron James!